Hello and welcome back to this video. Today we're going to be responding to Ocean Kel Toys the interpretation argument. A few days ago I saw it come up on my suggested feed on YouTube and I saw a thumbnail which said this argument defeats Christianity. So as a result I thought what better way is there to do than to actually respond to it, put on my apologetics hat on and do a good old responding video. I haven't done many of these responding videos of late however I know you guys all enjoy it so this is Apologetics for All responding to Ocean Keltoy on the interpretation argument. So let's get right into it. So today the plan of the video is that I'm going to go over his few formulations, his logical syllogisms that he raises, and give my thoughts on it and why those logical syllogisms are wrong. Of course there's more to the video than his logical syllogisms, but all everything else in the video are indeed just his, perhaps his suggested possible responses of a Christian and just a few other ideas that he raises which aren't really integral to the argument or the video as a whole so I will just stay away from responding to them and I'll just stick to his main syllogisms which I think is the main part of his argument and is all that we need to do in this video as a response. Of course if you're watching this Ocean Keltoy feel free to respond to this video or if you're an atheist and also support the interpretation argument feel free to respond to this video. The link of this video, I mean I'll be putting this link into the description section of his video as well and also you can just send me a description or any comments or responses in the comment below. I will try to get my get back to you. So let us get to his first formulation. So essentially in this video Ocean Keltoy raises three different formulations which are part of a ratio synagogue polysyllogistica. That means there are a few different syllogisms which go together in order to reach a certain conclusion. So the first premise that he raises is for any event God wants, he knows how to bring it about. The second premise of that is for any event God wants, he is capable of, of bringing it about. Conclusion, therefore, if God chooses to bring about a particular event, it must occur. So that is his first syllogism. And that is what he thinks. Of course, as we can see, his idea or his conception of God is that God is omnipotent and also God is omniscient. Premise one is God knows how to bring it about for any event. That means he's omniscient. And premise two says God is omnipotent because he is capable of bringing it about. So I think that this syllogism, or at least these two premises, are not very controversial. What we can see, however, is that the, pre the conclusion of this thing, I think, can be worded a bit better. I do not think that this is a significant response to his argument or anything like that. This is just one of the formulating steps or just one of the first assumptions that he's trying to create or a first kind of a first premise or a proposition that he wants to raise. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it per se, but I think it can be literally phrased as therefore God can bring about any particular event that he intends to do so. So instead of saying it must occur if he tries to bring it about. However, I think a more precise way which follows from the two premises is God can bring about any particular event that he intends to do so, which I think is very similar but just a bit more specific and closer to the first two. So now with that in mind, let us turn to the second premise or the second uh, syllogism which I think is the core of the interpretation argument. What he says is premise one, for any message God wants to communicate, he knows how to communicate it such that it would be interpreted correctly. Premise two, for any message God wants to communicate, he is capable of communicating it such that it will be communicated or interpreted correctly. Therefore, and this is the conclusion, if God chooses to communicate a message, it must be interpreted correctly. So seemingly this is a logical syllogism and if the premises are true, the conclusion must follow. However, I do not think that the premises are indeed true. There is no reason to grant the second part of each premise, which is it would be interpreted correctly in the first premise and in the second premise it will be interpreted correctly in both situations. It presupposes that the interpretation from the act of the communication to the interpretation is all controlled by God. However, if we look closer at the order at which it is communicated and the order at which the agency and the moral responsibility lies, we soon realize that God is not in full control over the the communication, the writing, the transferal of the information, and also the interpretation. God is only here responsible or morally responsible for 
giving the communication. God gives a communication and however the transferal and the receive the receival of the communication is in the hands of man. What I mean by that is God has given the Bible, the divine commandments to man. God has given it to man and man has right, written the Bible down and has been passed down through the centuries. Now what you see here is that this is a process full of free will. And that is something that God, at least in my interpretation of the Bible, of course, there are denominations which do not believe in free will. Perhaps Calvinists are more close to the predestination aspect of it, but I believe that there's free will. And if we accept free will, we soon realize that this argument does not does not appreciate this aspect of the Christian faith, which is there is free will and there is moral responsibility on the humans to interpret the Christian message properly. It is one thing for God to say, well, this is the command. And it is another thing to say, well, humans must logically or logically must interpret God's commands properly in every certain scenario because interpretation is an act of free will. For example, if I sent a message to my, a few of my friends, do you want to go and on the group chat, some of them might think that take it in a metaphorical way in the sense that I'm asking them for a fight. Some other people might think that I'm asking them out to go to a bar to hang out overnight for some, or go drinking, for example. So in each various situations, there can be different interpretations due to the free will of the agent who is receiving the communication, even though I attended something else. So I might be saying a certain message. However, it could be misinterpreted in different ways. However, the misinterpretation is not on me, but rather it's on the moral agency of the of those who receive it. So in the same way, God's commands could be something. However, if people are going to freely misinterpret it, then, then surely it cannot be God's problem or got nothing to do with God, whether about them misinterpreting it because there is this property of free will. So hence, what we see is that there is no reason for us to grant the conclusion, which is if God chooses to communicate a message, it must be interpreted correctly. As demonstrated before, God can choose to convey a message. However, it can be interpreted mis well incorrectly because the free will of the agents have chosen to misinterpret it or have not fully developed their knowledge and has approached it and just don't fully understand it. And that is on the agent and not on God. And a good example to illustrate this is if a five-year-old kid read the Bible without fully understanding the words in the Bible or understanding the concepts of the Bible, it's, there's a high likelihood that a five-year-old kid would misinterpret the Bible, not because they're purposely trying to be dece deceitful and spread misinformation about the Bible, but just because they ge generally don't know better. They can't interpret the Bible in a better way. And hence, it is not on God's fault or it's not on God to make sure that humans interpret the Bible correctly. Rather, it's human's job to really try to learn more about God and learn more about the Bible. So with this in mind, I would formulate his argument, I think his second argument, to a more precise and a more powerful argument in consideration of the free will of man, which I think would be in co concord with the Christian message and is a representation of the fact. Instead of having his argument, I will have this argument, premise one, and this is Josh's formulation. For any message that God wants to communicate, he knows how to communicate such that it can be interpreted correctly. Premise two, for any message God wants to communicate, he is capable of communicating it such that it can be interpreted correctly. Conclusion, if God chooses to communicate the message, it can be interpreted correctly. So as you can see, I haven't changed the overall syntax of the sentence, just that I've changed the would be and the will to can. So now it changes the moral implications from God, saying God must lead it to be such that it will be interpreted correctly, to God presenting a Bible verse or presenting an idea so that it, the onus is on the humans to interpret it correctly. So you can see that this appreciates the nature of free will and also appreciates the commandments of God to present something clearly. So here we can have two significant differences one is his interpretation, which does not appreciate free will and does not appreciate, appreciate the complete Christian narrative. And my formulation, which I think is way more powerful and way more reasonable to hold, providing a conclusion which is in concord with the Christian message and hence refuting 
the, this idea raised by the interpretation argument. So finally, let us respond or talk about his final formulation of the argument, which is, it is logically impossible for God's communication to be misinterpreted, premise one. Second, if God is all-knowing, a communication of a false proposition is a lie. Premise three, if there are contradicting interpretations, at least one must be false. Premise four, there are multiple instances of contradicting interpretations of God's communications, and hence conclusion, there is a path God, therefore God is a pathological liar. So what we can see is that there's no reason for us to grant number premise one. The first, pers the first premise of this argument, or the third formulation, collapses, and hence the rest of the argument collapses along with it. There's no reason to think it is logically impossible for God's communications to be misinterpreted. As I've demonstrated before, the free will of man allows it such that God's commandments can be misinterpreted. And that we, that's what we see throughout the Bible. And that's why I grant the third and the fourth propositions. So as we can see, the only premise that I don't grant is the first one, and hence the conclusion falls down. Because the first one is wrong, because as we've seen, said before, free will makes it such that makes it such that God can present a clear argument or a clear communication and it can be misrepresented by the free agency of man. So as we can see, the premise one does not need to be granted and we can have a consistent view of Christianity without the interpretation argument playing a significant objection to this view. So finally, the conclusion, since we've demonstrated the first premise is wrong, the conclusion also falls. But even if we granted all these four premises, the conclusion will also be false, because the greatest it can prove is therefore God is a liar and not a pathological liar, because pathological in the dictionary demonstrates that it is caused by a disease, and hence, since God cannot be, cannot catch the coronavirus or something like that, just cannot be a pathological liar. So we don't need to grant all the premises, and we can demonstrate that the, the interpretation argument that he raises is faced with insuperable objections. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you've enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. As always, I'll put the response link of this video onto his channel in the comments below. So if you're an atheist who've come here or part of or your Ocean Keltoy, then feel free to respond. I'll happily have a dialogue and have a discussion with you about this problem and we can see where that goes. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Stay safe. Like always, God bless. Stay safe and goodbye. I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.